Now again, t- again, today we're doing our big um, you know, series, and uh, we're doing Christmas at Unleashed. And again, we're so thankful that you're here. You know that during this time of year, that uh, it's one of the busiest times in our lives. A lot of times people don't come to church at Christmas time because their life is so busy in the month of December. You know, there's a lot of planning, a lot of preparation, a lot of shopping. There's so many different things, decorating, and, um, but we thank you so much that you, t- you took the time to be here. And again, the biggest thing we hope that you walk out of here with today is this, is is that we can all walk out of here with the understanding of the incredible gift that God has given us. So today what we're going to be talking about is the good news, the good news of Christmas and what Jesus came to do for us. But before we do that, would you please pray with me? Father, we just want to thank you so much for today. We thank you, Father, for this opportunity that as a church we get to come together and to celebrate, to remember the greatest gift that was ever given, the gift of your son. Father, we pray that today, that when we walk out of here, we'll know how you see us. We know, Father, that uh, what Jesus came to do for us, and because of that, we can walk out of here with a head held high, knowing that you got a plan and purpose for our life. We thank you so much for that promise. And again, Father, I pray that we can celebrate it today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, when it comes to to Christmas time, uh, a lot of people ask, you know, what's the big deal about Christmas, right? Why is it that here we are 2,000 years later after this baby was born in a manger? Why do we celebrate this 2,000 years later? I mean, shouldn't this have only affected the people of that time, the people of Bethlehem? You know, he was born there. But so why are we still celebrating this here 2,000 years later? And here's the reason, is that that was the greatest news to have ever happened. That this single event that happened 2,000 years ago is the event that changed history for all of us. It's the event that changed how we relate to God. So, so this was the event that the people were waiting for to fix and mend our personal relationship with God. So this is the greatest news ever, not just for the people of that time, but for us today. You see, uh, we, we see the story of Jesus in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those four books of the Bible are called the Gospels, right? And the Gospel, Gospel literally means good news, So the Gospels are the good news of Jesus Christ. So Jesus coming into the world is good news for us. Now, today we're going to look at, you know, what are the benefits to those good news for us today? Listen to what it says here in Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. It says this, And there were shepherds uh, living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy. So good news of great joy for who? For all the people. You know what that means? We're part of all the people. That the good news that brought great joy is for us as well. Not just there, all of us. So what what was the news? What was the good news? Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah. The word Messiah means the anointed one, the chosen one, the one who came to pay the price for our sin. So Jesus Christ was sent here and he said, the one that was gonna sacrifice everything for us, he is the Lord. So so that's the good news for us. See, it says here that God had a plan and purpose for Jesus. You know what I love about God? Is that every time God does something, there's a reason to doing it. Have you ever noticed that that's not true with us? Uh, with people, there are times in our life where we'll do something and there really was no reason to do it. We de- we've done it and went, uh, that was a mistake, right? I, if you have kids, okay, you know this. And if you were a kid, you've lived this, right? But if you have kids, you know that your kids have done something dumb at some point in their life and you ask them this question, what were you thinking? And they look at you with those sincere eyes and go, hmm, right? And you're like, what? You're like, what was the reason that you did that? They're like, I don't know. I just reacted. I don't know know what I, I have no answer for you. I can tell you this. I gave my mom a lot of stress when I was a kid and she would ask me that question a lot. What were you thinking? I'm like, I don't think I was. There really was no reason for that. But that's not true with God. See, with God, there's always a reason for everything that he does. And it's said that there was a reason for the the baby to be born in the manger. That a savior was born in that day. See, Jesus came, was born in a manger, but he didn't stay there. He grew up and then he paid the price for us on a cross. And and him doing that, Jesus coming into this world and paying the price for our sin on the cross completely changed everything for us. So today what I want to do is I want to show you four, four benefits that we get because God sent Jesus into the world. So let's look at number one. The first one is Jesus came to show us what God is really like. You know, if you look at our society, there's a lot of wacky ideas of what God, what people think God is. 
I've talked to people and I've said, hey, can you tell me like, like, can you tell me what you think God is like? And there's some crazy stuff out there. I mean, people will say, you know, and it, here's the wild thing is that no two people are the same. What they'll do is they'll kind of base God based on their experiences. You know, you can get out a married couple and you put them into two separate rooms and you ask them, can you tell me what God is like? And they'll say, well, I believe God is like this. And then the, their, their spouse will go, well, I believe God is like this. And it won't it match exactly. And so there are often times in a society that we're, what we're trying to do is we're trying to say, I believe God is like, and that, that, that's like trying to put God into our mold. It, it's, it's a mental mold that we say God is this, right? And God is going to fit within this mental mold. But here's the problem. Our mental mold is too small for the almighty, all-powerful God. It doesn't work. Trying to confine God into our mental mold of him is like trying to squeeze me into spandex. It doesn't work. It's an ugly sight, I'm telling you. You know, it doesn't work. <clears throat> and so God is much bigger than the mental mold that we try to put him in. And I've talked to people. Some people believe that, that God is this little old guy in the sky. That he's up there, he has a really long beard, you know, gray hair. He's, he's a little too old now to do stuff for himself, so he sends everyone else to go and do it for him, you know. I talk to people, they, they actually believe that. He's an old man with a big old long beard. But the Bible tells us that God is almighty and all-powerful, and that God doesn't decay, so because of that, he couldn't get old. You know, so, some people believe that God is this impersonal force. You know, kind of like, like Star Wars, right? May the force be with you. Right? And, and, and the, this impersonal force, that there's, that there's this power, there's this force kind of out there that you try to connect with and try to let it flow in and through your life, but, but it's, it's kind of impersonal. You don't really know what it is. It's kind of mysterious. But the Bible says that that's not true about God. That God is a loving father that wants to know and relate to his kids. Some people believe that God is this angry being that is always just pinpointing everything that you do wrong and is angry at you. Let me tell you something, church. God is not mad at you. God is mad about you. He loves you. He's not this angry being that's trying to push you away to say you're not worthy. Jesus Christ came, and we're going to show you this. He came to show us what God is really like, and he's a father that loves his kids. And do you know that you can look around at the world, and you can see by God's creation, some things about God. Uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, one thing you can see from creation is that you can see that God uh, likes variety. See, God created everything. God created every single one of us. And do you know that none of us are the same? None of us are the same. That, that we, all, we have different fingerprints, different DNA. God made you unique. And for some of you, <laughs> a little too unique. You know what I'm talking about? No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. You know, but, but God made all of us unique and precious and valuable if you have one of a kind of something how precious and valuable is that and God says you're one of a kind and so so God loves variety we see that God is powerful you, you know God created the ocean by looking at the ocean you know that you can see God's power because think about it he created the ocean and people go well how's the ocean powerful have you ever been hit by a big wave let me tell you, I have, where I was like, I can take it, boom. Yeah, I'm telling you, those ocean, the ocean is powerful, and God made it just like that. We see that God is great and, and big. He created the universe. We see that God is organized. You know that? That God is organized. Organization makes things function. I'll give you an example. That right now, if you look at the way the sun and the moon and the earth are in relationship to each other, that it has to be in perfect organization. If the, if the earth was a little closer to the sun, we would fry. A little further from the sun, we would freeze to death. There's perfect organization to make things work. Our bodies, a healthy body is a body that works together, that's organized, works in harmony. When things go wrong, when, when you have something in your body that doesn't function with everything else, that's where illness happens. You know what cancer is? Cancer is cells that have rebelled against its own body. They're not functioning together anymore. And we see where that leads. So, so we see that God is organized in, in his creation. If in order for it to function, it needs to have that organization. But see, but here's the thing. We can learn things about God by creation, but Jesus came to show us a side of God that we would never get from just looking at creation. See, Jesus came to show us the personal side of God. He came to show us that God loves us and wants to have a personal relationship with us.
Listen to what it says here in 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. It says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. Do you know who wrote that? That was one of Jesus' disciples. And he wrote that out of experience. He wrote that because he saw God's unconditional love. You see, in this world, there's love, but it's conditional love. I love you if. God looked at our brokenness and says, I love you regardless of all that. God, not only does God demonstrate love, but he, but he is love. And Jesus Christ came as a sign of God's love for us. For example, John three sixteen, most popular verse in the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. God demonstrated his love for us in this, that while we were broken people, while we were sinners, Jesus Christ came and paid the price for us. Now who does that for someone else? A loving father does that. A loving father is willing to sacrifice anything for his kids. Listen to what it says here in John chapter 1, verse 18. It says, no one has ever seen God but the one, talking about Jesus, and only son, who is himself God. Jesus is God in the flesh and is in the closest relationship with the father has made him known. Jesus came to make God known to us. You notice that it says there that he's in the closest relationship with the father. And so Jesus throughout his life, when he's praying, you know what he always prays? He prays to his father. And the one thing I love about this is that Jesus not only said he's my father, but Jesus said he's your father. This is why when Jesus told us, showed us how to pray, the Lord's Prayer, you know how it starts? The Lord's Prayer starts this way. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. It starts with our Father. Jesus says, Jesus told us right there, this is then how you should pray. First start by understanding that he's your heavenly Father that loves you and is there for you. So what, one thing Jesus came to do is see, during this time, it was all about religion. Jesus didn't come for religion. He came so we can have a relationship with our heavenly Father. So that's the first thing. Jesus came to show us what God is really like. The second thing is this. Jesus came to communicate God's message. He came to bring us the best news ever. Jesus was a messenger. Listen to what it says here in John chapter 18, verse 37. Jesus is talking here. Here's what he says. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. He says, I came to testify. I came to show you, to speak out and show you God's truth, God's message to you. Now, you notice the word that he used there. He used the word truth that he came to testify to the truth. Now, truth is a word that is very, you know, moved around today, mistranslated. We live in a society that's trying to get rid of truth. You know, we live in a society that's all about existentialism, whatever you believe, right? Relativism, if you believe it's true, then it becomes true. As long as it's true for you, then it's true. That's not true. I want you to know something. That doesn't work. If you believe it to be true, that does not make it true. I'll give you an example. I believe that I'm a great singer. <laughs> but if I told the music ministry, hey, you don't have to worry about coming in today. I got this. And I came up here and I sang all those songs, you wouldn't be here right now. It would have been another mass exodus, right? And you would have been, you would have been gone. You, you wouldn't have stayed. Why? Because here's what you would say. But I will tell you, I believe I'm a good singer. You would say, that's not true. See, just because you believe it doesn't make it true. And, you know, we live today in a society that's trying to get truth out of the way. I mean, you know that on the Internet, it's the wildest thing, that if you search the Internet, anyone can write anything about, anything about anyone or anything. It's the wildest thing. Like, seriously, that people will put false information online without any repercussion. They can put whatever they want on their social media. And I've seen where people would literally, you know, they will forward someone else's false information on to other people. Did you hear about this? I've had people show me their phones going, oh, hey, pastor, did you hear about this? And I was like, that's not true. How do you know it's not true? Because I studied it. Let me go ahead and show you. They're like, oh, I forwarded it on. You probably should delete that. You know, because it's not true. It's the wildest thing that we are willing to forward information. And we believe information 
without actually diving into the facts. And because of that, because of that, truth is being lost. But not only is truth being lost, people are being lost because they're following a lie. And Jesus says, I came to speak the truth. But he also said this in John 14, 6. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Jesus says, I'm the one that came. I speak truth. I am truth. I'm the one that came to help you have a relationship with God, to help, to bring you close in your relationship with him. I am the foundation that will sustain you. See, whenever you base your life on something that is false, it's only a matter of time before you have a storm and your life will fall apart because it's not solid. But if you base your life on a strong foundation, the foundation of truth in God, there's no storm that you can't overcome. You know, one thing I love about God is that there's one thing God can't do. And I've had people tell me, like, God can do anything. God's almighty, all-powerful. I'm like, yes, he is. But there is one thing he can't do. And the reason I know that is because God tells us that there's one thing he can't do. In Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18, it says there that it is impossible for God to lie. Because God is truth. So God cannot lie. So, which I tell you, that's the foundation that we need. And and God gives us his word, and his word is truth. When you read the Bible, it is transforming. But one thing I love about the Bible is that you notice the Bible, it gives us accurate information, accurate history. God doesn't try to gloss over stuff. I've talked to people that said, I don't want to read the Bible because I see ugliness in the Bible. And I'm like, I'm glad the ugliness is there. Because that shows us that God is not trying to make things sound better than they really were. See, if you look throughout the Bible, you see that there were messed up people. There was people that, that did bad stuff. And, and they were bad, and they made this bad choice, and they made this bad choice. And then later on in their life, God transformed their life, and they, God used them to do something incredible. I love that truth, because guess what? Every single one of us has made a bad choice, and made another bad choice. And God says, but you want, I want you to know something. I can still use your life to do something incredible. I love that God doesn't gloss over things. When someone writes a biography about other people, or you do an autobiography, you, know, you, know, you notice how they always try to make it look better than it is? Like, oh, that person was so fantastic. No, they weren't. We know the truth. And I love that God says, let me show you the truth. And, and I want you to know that there are huge benefits for us when we follow God's truth. There really are. That when we live our life in God's truth, there's benefits for us. Listen to what it says in John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32. It says, Jesus said, if you hold my, to my teaching, you, will, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. There it is. God's truth, when we base our life on that, it actually sets us free. It sets us free to live the life that God intended. It sets us free to live a life of purpose and of meaning and of hope. It it takes away the chains of the bondage of our past because every single one of us, let's admit, we have a past. There are certain things in your life where you said, I'll never do that again. But you notice that that thing grips you and it keeps trying to draw you back. And God says, I came to set you free from that thing that's trying to pull you back. That's what Jesus came to do for us. Let me tell you, I am now half my life that right with God when I gave my life to Jesus. I actually, uh, my first 22 years of my life, I didn't have a relationship with God. And actually, on October 25th, just a few months ago, was 22 years ago that I gave my life to Jesus. So half of my life, I've gave my life. So I am now two months that I've actually had been in a relationship with God longer than, I've actually, than I didn't. And I got to tell you, I would have could never imagine what God was going to do in my life. Back then, I'll be honest with you, I didn't even think I wanted God in my life. I mean, I, I, went, I went to college. I was an engineer. I was doing well financially. I thought, everything, I, thought I had it all figured out. And, and I remember this, that, that when someone tell, told me about Jesus, at first I'm like, I, I don't think I want that. I don't think I want it. And, and, and I got to tell you, it's the most amazing thing that now I step back and I realize, I go, oh, my goodness. How badly did I need that? God changed everything. You see, one thing I had mixed up back then, it was, I, th- I thought success, that success was enough. But let me tell you something. You can be successful and have no purpose. You can have money and let your life have no meaning. It's not just about acquiring stuff, because I promise you this, that, the, that you can acquire everything in the world physically, and when you die, you don't take any of it with you. 
And so there's something so much more and so much greater. And God wants us to live an incredible life. And God came to fix what is broken, which is the third thing that Jesus came to do. He came to fix what is broken. You see, if you look around the world, you see that we live in a broken world. But it didn't start that way. If you go back and you look in the book of Genesis, in the book of Genesis, you see that God created a perfect place called the Garden of Eden. That in the Garden of Eden, that there was no death, no sickness, no sorrow, no mourning, no tears. It was a perfect place. Perfect place. And God said he wanted us to live there with him forever. But then we chose sin rather than God. See, all sin is is rebelling against God. That we used our free will, went in the wrong direction, chose against God. And at that point, God says that because of our free will, choosing against God, and it wasn't just Adam and Eve that sinned. Every single one of us has sinned. We've all made mistakes. Because of that, everything got broken. And the Bible now describes the, the world as fallen. It's a broken world. Now, let's admit, we've all seen that. We've all experienced the brokenness. If you've lived any, in any amount of time in this world and you weren't living in a bubble, we know how brokenness is there. There's health there's, there's brokenness in relationships. There's brokenness in our finances. There's, there's brokenness in our, in our own bodies, our own minds. We struggle with things, with depression. We, we see the brokenness all around us. And I want you to know that what Jesus came to do is he came to fix that. He came to fix the brokenness of this world. Listen to what it says here in Luke chapter 19, verse 10. It says this, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. What was lost with sin? Everything. We broke the world. But the biggest thing that was lost with sin was the direct relationship with God that we had. If you go back and you read through the Old Testament, you see that people related to God very different from that point on. You see that there were certain people that God would use to go and speak to the people. They didn't have a direct relationship with them. But 2,000 years ago when Jesus came, you know, Jesus, the Bible says that Jesus was our mediator. To mediate literally means to bring together. That Jesus brought us back together. That you can pray directly to God. That you don't have to have someone else pray for you on your behalf. That we can have that direct relationship with God. Because Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. And, but people don't like to admit that they're lost. Actually, people look at that and they get angry about it. I still remember myself 22 years ago. When someone was talking to me about why I needed Jesus. And they talked about how we're, we're lost without him. And I'm like... I'm not lost. You see my car? Let me show you what I got. But see, then I realized how lost I was because when I really stepped back and thought about it, there were so many times I just wanted to end my life because the stuff never brought true joy. When I was honest with myself, I realized that I wasn't living a life of meaning and of purpose. I realized that when my life ended here, that it was going to be over. And I wasn't going to go on to live in, 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 in eternity. And that's what Jesus came to do for us. See, and I've talked to people about what that means to be lost. And at first people get angry. Don't tell me I'm lost. But you see, part of it is this, is the reason we get angry is we believe that it means that we've, we have no direction. That, 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 we're, that we're just wandering around and people don't, don't like to feel that way. But I want you to know something, that when Jesus says here that he came to seek and to save that which was lost... He's telling us what he came to do for us because the relationship that we had was lost. And let's focus on what he came to do. He came to seek and to save. By him saying that we're lost, he's showing us our value. Think about this. If you lose something that's important, you seek it and you try to save it because it's important. If it doesn't mean anything, what do you do? I don't need it. See, you misplace things that aren't valuable but when you lose something that's valuable you do whatever it takes to find it some of us we would lose our minds if we lost our cell phones i mean some people you'll start yelling at your family right because you lost your cell phone right and like no i know you touched it last right and, and no i need my cell phone you don't need your cell phone guess what you will survive you know but, but but the thing is this is we go no it's important to me i have to see what's on social media no but it, it's important but let's admit that if you lost, if you're a parent, you lost a child, it would be a whole lot more important to look for them. Now, let me tell you, like, I have three kids, and when they were little, um, 
I, I used to take them to like the mall. We go to the swap meet. We go to places, you know. And, and I have to admit, um, there was a couple times where I lost my kids. And I had to go find them. And, and it was, this was all pre-baby uh, or, or kid um, leashes. You know what I'm talking about? Now you can strap them in. You have like a leash for a kid. I feel so sorry for the little kids. They're like, they're trying to run away, you know, and they're getting pulled back. But, but before all of that, what you would do is you would take your kids and hold their hands. And if you had more kids than you had hands, you would have them hold each other's hands. And then you would walk and you'd go to the store, you'd go to the mall. And I, 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 there were a couple times I lost a kid. And it's the wild, it, it, it was actually when they started getting a little older because here's what they wanted to do. Dad, I don't want you to hold my hand. I'll just walk next to you. Okay. So I'm like, all right, stay right here next to me. And we start walking. I look over and I'm like, oh, it, it only takes seconds to lose them, right? They were gone. And I'm like, no way. Now here's what I didn't do. I didn't look at that and go, well, I still got two. I'm doing pretty good. Well, I misplaced them, you know. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't go to another parent that had a well-behaved kid and said, hey, do you want to trade? Uh, mine's a runner, but hey, you get a leash for him, you're good, right? I, I didn't do any of that. You know what happened when I looked over and one of my kids wasn't there? My heart started racing. You start sweating. You start freaking out. Your mind starts running and trying to figure out, like, you know, did somebody take them? Oh, I will. T-. You already start thinking about all the ninja moves you're going to do if you find somebody trying to take your kid, right? You're going through all of that stuff, and you look, and you look, and you don't stop looking until you find them. First of all, if I didn't come home with them, my wife would kill me. But I didn't say, you know what? Two's better than none. I guess we're good. Why? Because my kids are valuable. And God says... That because of our sin, we were lost in that relationship. He said, but I came to seek you and to save you. I want to have a relationship with you. I'm willing to pay whatever sacrifice I need to pay for you. Because I'd rather die than to live without you. That's how precious and valuable we are to God. See, there's this misconception about God that God is just up there and that Jesus Christ came to, to make people feel bad, to condemn the world, to tell them that they're horrible and that they're horrible. Nothing can be further from the truth. See, in John 3, 16, most famous book, you know, verse in the Bible, again, it says there, for God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. The very next verse, verse 17, listen to what it says. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn it, to condemn the world but to save the world through him. That's why Jesus came. He came to save us, to bring us back. That, you know, the, the, the reason God sent Jesus as he was was because we needed a savior. If we just needed more teaching, he would have just sent a teacher, an instructor. But the, he knew that the biggest thing that every single one of us needs at the core of who we are is we need forgiveness. We need to be made new. And so because of that, he sent a savior to fill the greatest need that we have. Because God wants us to have an amazing life, which is the last thing there on your notes. Jesus came to give you an amazing life. Look what it says here in John chapter 10, verse 10. It says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But Jesus says this, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. You notice what Jesus said there. He prepares us. He says there's an enemy out there that's trying to distract us and pull us in the wrong direction. He wants to destroy our lives. But Jesus came to give us life and that we will live it abundantly, live it to the full. See, Jesus didn't come for us to become more religious. He, Jesus didn't come to put more rules and regulations in place. Jesus came to have a relationship, to give us a life, an abundant life. Now, do you know what that, that verse implies? That without God, we're not living life to the fullest. That without God, that we're not living the abundant life. Now, some of us, we don't even know that. See, before I gave my life to Jesus, I thought I was living the abundant life. I had material possessions. But, but see, I was blind because I couldn't see all the great things that God had in store for me. But when I realized my brokenness and I gave my life to God, I then started following God day in and day out. And I can tell you now, 22 years later, I see the huge difference that God makes in our life, that he gives us an abundant life. I, I, I got to tell you, I don't deserve the life that I have. I don't deserve the wife that I have, the kids that I have. I don't deserve to do any of this, and yet God so freely gives and wants to bless our life. 
He wants us to have an abundant life, every single one of us. You don't have to be a pastor to make a difference. Jesus will use you right where you are to change the world around you. But see, but there's something that's trying to steal, trying to rob the life that God wants to give us, the abundant life. There are two thieves that try to steal that life, the past and the future, yesterday and tomorrow, the regrets of yesterday and the worries of tomorrow. See, because if we are constantly living in the regrets of yesterday and the worries of tomorrow, we can't live an abundant life today. We can't live a complete life today, the life that God wants for us. And God doesn't want us to live in the brokenness of yesterday. He doesn't want us to be concerned and scared about, about tomorrow. The Bible tells us that where God is, that fear is gone. That God wants to give us a life of hope and of meaning and of purpose, that that's his plan for us. So, so how do we accept that? The Bible calls it a word, salvation. Salvation literally just means to be saved. Because Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. It means that we accept that incredible gift that God wants to give us. And the beauty is this, and I can tell you from my testimony. Testimony is just your life story. That God will take brokenness and you follow him day in. Do your best. When you stumble, you get back up. You know that God doesn't turn his back on you when you fail, but he's there to help lift you back up. And you pursue him and do, you follow him. And the more and more that you pursue and follow him, the more and more that the regret and the shame and the guilt and the brokenness of the past gets further and further away. And you get to live in the freedom that God intended for us. And that freedom, let me tell you something, the abundant life isn't just today. It's for all of eternity. And do you know that we have not even begun to experience the greatness that God wants to do in your life? You know, one thing I say here often is, with God, the best is yet to come. People have asked me, where did you get that from? Was it just because you just like saying it? I'm like, no, it's actually out of, out of the Bible. Do you know that you haven't experienced God's best in your life yet? That the rest of your life can still be the best of your life? That, 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 God, that your mind can't even comprehend the goodness that God wants to do in your life. It's based out of Scripture. Listen to what it says here in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. See, we believe we've already experienced God's best. God goes, oh no, the best is yet to come. It says, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard. So you haven't experienced it yet, and what no human mind has conceived. So you, haven't, you can't even conceive it, can't even think about it. The things God has prepared for those who love him. With God, the best is yet to come. And that's the gift that he came to give us on Christmas Day. You see, during Christmas time, we're going to receive all kinds of gifts. You're going to give gifts. You know, you go shopping for that perfect gift to give to someone, and you get to open up your gifts. But I, but I want you to know something, that the, the greatest gift that was ever given on Christmas Day was Jesus Christ. Jesus, God gave us the most incredible gift. This is why we celebrate Christmas 2,000 years after it happened. Why? Because God loves us. He's got a plan for us. And this is the only gift that you'll take for eternity. Every other gift. Let me tell you something. You're, if you get some awesome stuff this Christmas, by next Christmas, 50% of it will probably be broken. Maybe more. If you're like me, it's going to be broken by next week, right? I mean, it's the craziest thing. You can get, like, you see these commercials on TV, and some of these commercials are lies, when they show that husband who brings home, they get, closes his wife's eyes and says, here, come outside. And they go outside and they open up their eyes and there's a Lexus with a bow. That's not real. <laughs> if, I, if I did that to my wife and I said, babe, look what I bought. She's like, why did you get us in debt? I can't believe you did that, right? I mean, so, so, so that's not real. But even if they did, even if somebody got you that Lexus, you can't take the Lexus with you. The only thing we can take is what we do with Jesus. That's what we can take for eternity. It's the greatest gift ever given. Listen to what it says here in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 15, because it reminds us of this. When someone gives you a gift at Christmas, you know what you tell them when they give it to you? Thank you. It says, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. That's what Christmas is about. That's the reason for the season. That, you know that God was the original gift giver. 
before we started giving gifts and receiving gifts, God had already given us the greatest gift ever given. God wants to give us hope and meaning and purpose, but it all starts with us accepting that gift. And that gift is available for every single one of us. If you've already accepted the gift of Jesus, let's keep moving forward. Keep following God. And you're going to see that all that stuff, and some people say, look, I gave my life to Christ, but there's still stuff there. I'm telling you, take your next step. Because the past stays over there, but you keep taking your next step. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Christ, but you're saying, I want that. I want a life of, of forgiveness. I want a life that I don't, have to, I don't have to consider and think about that stuff that I've done, the shame and the regret, regret and the brokenness. And I, I'm ready to live the life that God intended for me to live. I want to have purpose. And I want to be with God for all of eternity. It all starts with you saying, I accept the gift of Jesus. If that's you here today, you're saying, hey, I, I'm ready to. I want to accept that incredible gift. Please head on back to the Red Connections table back there. You know, Pastor Brent's back there. You know, we'll have somebody else with a lanyard. Please go talk to them. We'll, we want to help you take your next step in your relationship with God. I, actually, right after this service right now, we already have someone who's, who's getting baptized. So that's awesome. So yeah. So if you're, <laughs> hey, if, you, if you're saying, hey, I'm ready to do it, let's do it. Because with God, the best is yet to come. Let's pray. Father, we just want to thank you so much for today. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity that we get a chance to step back and to remember what Christmas is all about. Father, help us to remember that Jesus really is the reason for the season. Father, the whole reason that we give gifts during this time and receive gifts is because the greatest gift that was ever given. We thank you so much for loving us the way that you do. Father, we thank you that even though we've all gone astray, we broke your perfect creation, we've all sinned. And even though we broke things, you've never given up on us. We thank you, Father, for loving us the way that you do. Help us to love you not just with our words, but with our lives. Because, Father, we know that when we pursue you with everything we've got, it's not because we're trying to earn your love. When we follow you, it's not trying to earn your love, Father, but it's because we understand that we received your love. Help us to walk in that. We thank you so much. Father, we praise our honors in Jesus' name. Amen.